So you're ready for week four. In week one, you learned some logic. In week two, you learned how to prove programs correct. In week three, you learned how to derive programs, in particular loop-based programs over one-dimensional arrays correct. And now what? Surely you're done. Well, part of the problem is that you may have noticed during week three, if you're a somewhat experienced programmer, that the kind of manipulation you have to do with indices when you derive your program to be correct is not that different from the kind of manipulation you have to do when you write the program in the first place without first deriving it to be correct. And there are indices in the program, which is where you tend to make most of your mistakes in these kinds of programs. And there are indices in the quantifiers, where you probably made some mistakes along the way as well, and you might even have discovered some mistakes that I made in the materials. So that's a problem. And this may very well be one of the reasons why this has been all very nice and why a lot of people think that this kind of material is very interesting when it comes to teaching people how to think about programs but why it never really quite caught on the way we think it should have caught on. And what are we going to do about that? Well, in the launch you're going to get a glimpse at what we're going to do about that and then in the rest of this week you're going to learn a little bit more and we believe that by the end of the week you will see that there's actually something to it. But there's still a secret ingredient missing and that secret ingredient is abstraction. This is what Dijkstra might call elegance. Okay, so how do we do this but how do we do it elegantly? How do we do it in a way so that all of these indices don't clutter our thinking. Let's have a look. All right, so let's go back to the dot product. So we might want to do the dot product of two vectors. And we tended to denote that with this T here, which stands for transpose. Now why is that? Well, that's because the T transposes this, which then becomes a 1 minus 1, 2, 2, 1 minus 1. And we've commented on the fact that in MATLAB, everything is an array. And you can think of a vector as a column vector, or you can think of it as a uh, matrix that has three rows and one column in this particular case. And then the T means transpose that, which means it becomes a row vector, or a 1 by 3 matrix. And then if you remember how to do a matrix matrix multiply, you remember that it's this times that plus this times that plus this times that, which is exactly how the dot product is also defined. It's the sum of the products of the corresponding elements. So the answer in this case is then 1 times 2 minus 1 minus 2 is minus 1. Okay, so normally when you first program something like this up, you might want to write down a few examples like this, get a feel what the problem is, and then kind of guess at what the um, program should be. And at some point you might say, well, instead of having actual numbers there, we might want to store these numbers in an array X and an array Y. And that then leads you to, hmm, in general, what is this for th uh, vectors of size 3? Well, you could write that as the sum over i of 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to 3 of xi times yi. Okay, and then you say, yeah, but we don't want to write programs just to take the dot product of two vectors of size 3. So how do we generalize that? Well... We can say dot, 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 and make this an n instead of a 3, and make this a dot, 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 and make this an n instead of a 3, and then we get the specification of the dot product using a quantifier. And then if we had to come up with a post condition, let's say that we 
leave the result in variable t, then this would become your post condition. And that might be the process that you would go through. And now, instead of doodling with a bunch of examples, trying to get a feel for what this operation is, and then try to write a program for it, we start with the specification, and from that we derive the program. And what this was the key to deriving a loop-based program for doing this? The key was to come up with a loop invariant. And how did we do that? Well, we said, take this, split the range, Now we have split the range into the summation over the first k minus 1 terms here and then the rest of the terms. And then we always had to sort of scratch our head and say, well, what about k? Is k between 0 and n? Is k between 1 and n plus 1? Hmm, what does that need to be? Well, you know what? That's exactly the same kind of thinking that you were used to doing when you were writing just a quick loop and you had to think about, hmm, what is the loop card? Right? But hopefully you would get it right and hopefully we taught you some techniques to very systematically think this through so that if you take the time to think it through, you actually get it right. But there's opportunity for error. We do not like opportunity for error. Okay, so how do we avoid this? Well, there's this secret ingredient. And the secret ingredient is abstraction. When we communicate with each other about needing a dot product computed, we don't tend to write this down. We tend to write down that we would like to compute D equals X transpose Y where we understand what that operation is. It's something you learned in linear algebra. Okay? So, wouldn't it be much better to have that be what you need to compute? Right? And then this here. Well, you can look at that and say, well, that looks an awful lot like a dot product of the two vectors except only the first k minus 1 elements in each of these vectors. And then we do a dot product with the rest of it. Hmm, how can we get there? Well, we can take our vector x and say, let's think of it as a top part and a bottom part. The first k minus 1 elements, the rest of the elements. Let's think of our vector y as a top part and the bottom part. First k minus 1 entries, the rest of the entries. Could be that this has zero entries and this is all the entries. What is important is that the number of entries here is the same as the number of entries here because when you do this summation, this partial summation, this first part of the range, the number of elements in x must be the same as the number of elements in y. Now, so, how do we split the range on an expression like this? Well, there's two ways to look at it. One way to look at it is to go back and say, well, this is really this. This I know how to split the range of. This I know is just the dot product of the top parts of the two vectors. This is just the dot product of the bottom two parts of the vectors. And there you have it. This is the splitting of the range. And we don't have to think about the details of this because somehow the splitting is implicit in the fact that you partition the vectors. And therefore you don't have to worry about that so much. Okay? There's a second way of thinking about it. And that is to say, look, how is, well, let's think about it this way. 
x really is just the vector but split into two parts. And similarly y is just a vector split into two parts. So, this dot product is really the same as this dot product and now all you need to know is how do I take the dot product of partitioned vectors? Well, if you took our first massive open online course, you would have learned how to do that, I believe it was in section 1.6. And there what we teach people is to say, look, when you want to do this, let's take this and do what you would do if these were numbers. If these were numbers, what would you do? You would write them as side by side because it is the row vector that you get. But x top here represents a column vector, so what you've now done is created something that has two column vectors, possibly of different size, next to each other. Hmm we need to also transpose them to make each of them into a row vector. That's the equivalent of what we did here if, say, we partitioned the vectors like that. And then what do you notice? It's this times that plus this times that. That's the dot product of the first part plus this times that, which is the dot product of the second part. So, if you now take the dot product of that with the partition vector y, what you get is, ah, exactly this. So, if you had a decent background in linear algebra, you would be able to go from this to the partitioning of the vectors, to this, to that, to this expression right here, which really just represents the splitting of the range that you saw in weeks two and three. Ah, a lot easier to write down. A lot easier to do if you only remember a few simple facts from linear algebra. If you don't remember those facts from linear algebra, you're still going to be okay because what I always tell my students when they run into something like this is go back to how you would do it if these were just numbers. If this was just two numbers, what would you do? You would write it as this. And you would do this times that plus this times that. The equivalent here is take this, take the symbols, put them next to each other. You do have to remember that these are vectors and that therefore you need to also transpose the vectors. And then you symbolically do this times that plus this times that, which is what you did here. This times that plus this times that. Okay, so what do we have now? We have this clearer way of writing down what we want to compute. We have a cleaner way of writing down what you get when you split the range. Could that perhaps translate into a cleaner way of annotating algorithms and or deriving algorithms? What I want you to do is go and do exercise 4.1.1.1 and then we'll discuss this a little bit more in the next video. And then by the time you get through with week four, you'll understand all about it.